Welcome to the MMA Viva section. I am I am surprisingly joined by Connor Rubish, Rubish uh, this week. He, Say uh, Rubish this week, Zane. I deserve it. No, 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 Rubish. I whatever. Um, he, you know, we're glad to have him back. I'm glad to see him. I can't strangle him from this far away, so I have to be glad to see him. We are here to talk about the Tough 24 Tournament of Champions finale. Demetrius Johnson versus Tim Elliott. I can't believe Tim Elliott won. I didn't, I don't know. I didn't expect that had it. I didn't see it coming. My, my cable provider didn't see it coming and spoil it for me on the uh, information card for the episode. People weren't telling this the moment the tournament was saying this, the moment the tournament was announced. I didn't receive an email from an anonymous source a week after the show started saying that Tim Elliott had won. No idea. Blown away. No, no clue. Came way out of left field. We are all very happy to, uh, you know, to, to, to watch this new and awesome fight that we had no no clue was coming. Uh, and we're going to break down this fight card, which honestly, after last week's Brunson Whitaker card, and I realized that ended with, a, a, you know, a pretty cool, fun bout at the end there. But this is a good, nice this is a refreshing step up from that card. I guess. Yeah, there, there are basically no fights in this card that I have zero reason to care about, which is a yeah. step up from last week where there were a few. This, and, and stylistically, most of these fights should be pretty fun uh, or at least weird where they're not action-packed. So I, I'm actually looking forward to this card. I won't be able to watch it because it'll be my anniversary on Saturday, but it'll make for some good Sunday afternoon viewing. There you go. So we're just going to dive straight in then, bottom of the card, with a light heavyweight bout. Um, actually, I don't even know, like, Tapology now has this in a different order, and I need to check UFC.com real quick, because this card has, I think, I don't know, like, it's been, I think because of the last minute uh, tough stuff and all that, like, it just feels, feels like it's been a bit wonky, like, different sites have something different listed. Uh, okay, good. Wikipedia is right, but they have one of the weights wrong. That's all that matters. Uh, so starting with a light heavyweight bout between Josh Stansbury and Devin Clark. So not it's light heavyweight and not, not middleweight. A, not a middleweight bout is listed. Devin Clark is moving up to light heavyweight to fight Josh Stansbury. So, um, Shall I take this one first? Yeah, you just go ahead, dive right in. Um, I think this is an interesting fight between two guys with potential. Josh Stansbury has a little bit of, physically, he kind of reminds me of Chris Weidman uh, or John Vellante, um, uh, which is a hard line to draw technically. That's a pretty wide gap. But both guys are kind of these big, seemingly slow, but strong and um, strong fighters with good timing. And that's Stansbury in a very rough way because he, he needs a lot of development. Um, he did make some strides from his time in the Ultimate Fighter to his first fight in the UFC. His striking was at least there. He was at least comfortable enough to throw his hands. He showed that he was willing to take shots. He was, dare I say, a cut-rate Dan Kelly in that fight. Uh, hadn't quite learned how to put his weird strikes together as well as Kelly does. But um, a, a pretty solid performance and shows improvement. And then Devin Clark was basically having his way with Alex Nicholson before getting caught with one of the weirdest knockout punches I've ever seen. This kind of bizarre right hook during a takedown sprawl, something like that. It was very strange. Um, and, you know, how can you predict, account for that? It does maybe suggest that Clark doesn't have a great chin, but Stansbury is also not a super accurate or powerful striker. Um, his more his his strength is more sort of physical with the wrestling and grappling. Um, I'm gonna say Clark by because he's got a little more speed and explosiveness to him. I don't think Stansbury is gonna threaten him with knockouts the same way, and if he can't, then Clark has I think better movement at range. He's just faster in basically everything that he does, and is probably the better explosive wrestler. Although it will be interesting to see these guys tangle on the ground. Big problem for me with Devin Clark at this point is uh, it, it's sort of the same problem I have with fighters like Danielle Taylor, although Soheham got robbed, but whatever, or um, the other fighter last week that I felt this way about, John Herrera. Very easy sure, to yeah. see all this athletic potential there and to be really wowed by it and taken by it as a fan. 
but the actual in cage product is just not ready to, for this level of fighting. And that's what I, you know, this is a dude who started in in like late 2013. He's been fighting 2014, 2015, and now, you know, a couple fights in 2016, just three years into his career. He's a great athlete. He looks, you know, he's got power. He's got a well-rounded, well, you know, nicely spaced out game. He wrestles. He throws with power. But the depth is just not there. Mm -hmm. Um, I think he's much more of a power takedown artist than he is a great controlling force on the ground. Somebody who has to, when he when he wants to control on the ground, can't deliver a lot of strikes to go with it. And striking is just his defense is too inconsistent, and his output is too inconsistent. Yeah. You know, in that Nicholson fight, I was watching it, and he was like he was doing well for a while, landing shots, getting the better of Nicholson, and then when Nicholson started to land, his reactions were bad. He started turning away. He started, you know, tr- just not he didn't take shots well it was a sage north cut type of yeah. situation without sage north cuts hyper athletic bursts yeah. you know like it, it, it's not that same ridiculous level that north cut has to cover for all the obvious flaws mm-hmm. and stansbury is not great at anything but he's a pretty experienced regional light heavyweight vet at this point and he's tough as hell like he's one of those guys who can just come forward and brawl is a very willing brawler has a good chin has been tested in a lot of tough fights and seeing him willing to take shots and and trade a little bit when he needed to was a good sign for him yeah like and and, you know I, i i think a lot of guys they actually regress on tough they just go back to what they're super super comfortable with because they don't have time to build that comfort into the rest of their game that they would normally show in camp. It's been our complaint about tough for a long time. Like tough could be great. Let the guys have their coaches. Maybe let them cut at a compromised, compromised to a compromised weight class for the competition. You know, something to, to to bring out something that looks like the fighter we're used to, because giving a guy all new coaches that he doesn't get to choose and putting him in this restrictive weight class and then giving him like two or three weeks to prepare for a string of opponents is not a likely way to get the best out of, to get really great performances out of these guys who are legitimately solid prospects. Yeah. So it stands right to me. He has a bit of the Ryan O'Connell or the Sean O'Connell feeling where it's not pretty, but he hits with some power and he's tough enough and trust. He, he has enough confidence in his game that he can be a reasonable brawler at 205. And Clark, it just, you know, I, I see the potential, but I also, see, I basically see a lot of like Jonathan Wilson, where it's just like, ah, oh, this guy could be so good, but you throw him in there with a the dude like uh, Luis Enrique, who well, is tough as of, shit. The eater of worlds. Nobody's beaten Luis Enrique. <laughs> yeah. And it's just like, Henrique is going to win because he's way tougher and he can brawl, you know, he can and will brawl when he needs to. And much like the Nicholson fight, he won just because he was able to do that because he was actually getting beaten and he got hurt badly and still came back to win. It's that grit and experience that counts against a lot of these young, like transitional athletic fighters. Yep. So I'm taking Stansbury here just based on that. Uh, Odds on this fight are basically about even Stansbury is a slight favorite minus 108 to minus 120 Clark the underdog plus 100 to minus 115 I frankly would not bet on this fight I would not necessarily even well you might say let's see over one and a half rounds is minus 140 I don't think that's a uh, yeah because I don't think Stan- Stansbury's not going to knock Clark out the the way Nicholson did. I don't think he's has the same kind of power or the same kind of brawling instincts. He's still developing that. Yeah, he may not. I I don't know. I, he that, could. If Clark's he, chin is really as bad as it looked because it did not look great with that punch that Nicholson landed. Then he yeah. certainly could. Yeah, I I would. The over under bets on on round time is probably the best you can do. 
they're often the safest bets because they have the closest lines in yeah. fights where you get a much stronger feeling of is someone going to be finished than you do of is this person going to win. Yeah. But otherwise, I think it's a real, especially a light heavyweight with guys that are, will, you know, Clark has some power, some athleticism. Stansbury does not have a lot of athleticism. It's a real toss up. So yeah, I think I the, odds are pretty the, the lines look good. Yeah. And that brings us to a middleweight bout Elvis Mutopchich, Anthony Smith. Um, this should be a weird ass action fight. <laughs> yeah. I think this is, I mean, it's kind of must win territory for both guys because they are almost absolutely certain to get exactly the fight they want. And yeah. when both guys are getting the fight they want, you know, somebody has to shine. Somebody has to show their absolute potential in that situation. I kind of want to pick Mutopchich because I have – his game is fundamentally stronger than Anthony Smith's. It's more well-rounded. He's more – he's got better cardio. He's more durable. But he doesn't have the pathological aggression that Smith has. He doesn't have the confidence that Smith has early in fights. So it's tough. I, I, I'm going to pick Mutopchich because Mutopchich does not get knocked out. He's got a good chin. And he is he's just he's tough to finish. And Anthony Smith, if he can't finish someone, he feeds really, really badly, and his game gets super one-dimensional. Yeah. But it'll be interesting. Like, the first round could be really bad for Elvis Mutopchich. Because I think Elvis Mutopchich, he sort of fights like he has to gain confidence over a fight. He has to start feeling like – he has to start figuring out how, that he can't be hurt and that he he won't get just run over. Whereas Anthony Smith is the exact opposite, where he starts with all this confidence, and the moment things start going bad, it just everything drains out of his game. So Anthony, it's sort of the Anthony Smith more has, has sort of the Phil Baroni thing going on. So I, I'm i pick Mutopchich in that fight, but it'll be an interesting one. Yeah, it's uh, Mutopchich has felt like kind of a letdown honestly, uh, since coming into the UFC. I kind of expected pretty good things out of him. He was one of the top guys uh, at middleweight on the regional scene for quite a while, and he has not really delivered. And I, and I think it's a little bit like when I expected good things out of Sam Alvey and he fought Tom Watson. And I suddenly saw this bad style matchup that I hadn't seen before and suddenly realized how, in what ways Sam Alvey was limited. And very similarly, since then, I have been very clear about calling Sam Alvey a counterpuncher. I think Mutopchich is the same way. Exactly what you described about kind of having to gain confidence, I think Mutopchich is strongly locked into the approach of a counterpuncher because he has to get his reads he has to let you lead and probably get hit a little bit in the, uh, uh, during the process to figure out where his counters are. And then like Sam, he really struggles to turn it on if he needs to come forward and get aggressive to get the win. I think there is no more damning, uh, no more damning assessment of Mutopic's limitations than the Kevin Casey fight. People, fans of this show will know that uh, when I do show up, I'm generally not that impressed with Kevin Casey. Uh, and Kevin Casey got a deserved draw against Mutopchic, even though Mutopchic completely dominated the third round because Mutopchic dominating a round against a gassed opponent is not the same as somebody else dominating a round against a gassed opponent. It is, he, he genuinely struggled to come forward and pull the trigger against a guy who had nothing left. And uh, yeah, it's who, who, where else did we see that recently? We saw that. Oh, uh, we saw it with Shevchenko against Nunes. Very similar. Yeah. Somebody else who was really reliant on their counter striking and has somebody who is ripe for the picking and can't manage to pluck them out of the cage. So uh, the, what I see in this fight is Anthony Smith having like one and a half good rounds where he gets a chance to let his hands go and and uh, and hurt Mutopchich possibly, or at least throw a lot more volume and lead more. 
Uh, and I think that may be enough for him to win the first two. And I don't trust Mutopcic to get Smith out of there in the third. Um, Smith was not finished when he fought. Was it uh, Leonardo Guimaraes, the Brazilian that he fought, who also tried to counterpunch, also got pieced up in the first two rounds, and also came back. But even Guimaraes is much better getting aggressive than Mutopcic is, much more willing to chase the finish when he needs it. And he couldn't quite get Smith out of there. So I don't think Smith is fragile enough for Mutopcic to get him out of there. With I, I his... wouldn't pick Mutopcic to get a KO. No, and it's, yeah, not with his style. And I think he, he, this may be the kind of fight where he needs a late KO to win um, or like a big 10-8 round or something. So I, I'm going to go with Anthony Smith by decision. All right. Yeah, I can see that. It, it, it's an interesting one. It's a tough one. I do want to. I, I like Mutopcic. I want him to succeed. But. It should be fun. I mean, any kind, any kind of fight where you can reliably predict a momentum swing is often entertaining. So yeah, it'll like be the fun second, to see. the second round of that fight will be really interesting. Yes, second and third. I think. I think all the there'll be two very different fights in the first and yep. third rounds if it goes that far. And, and I'm looking forward to seeing which one of those is the more impressive kind of fight. Mutopcic is the underdog. Plus 103 down to minus 110. Smith, the favorite, minus 112 down to minus 125. Basically dead even. I don't have any real problem with those. Works for me. I would not put any kind of bet on this fight whatsoever. Be it finish, over, under, anything. Um, Smith hits really hard. Yeah, over one and a half rounds is minus 180, which I don't think is is close enough to no. make any money there. Both Safety. guys have chins. Smith hits hard. Both guys have real consistency problems in the fight itself. So yeah, don't think there's really anything you can do with that at all. That brings us to the first uh, fight on FS1, Kylan Curran, Jamie Moyle. Kylan Curran, uh, I think... Had uh, some like uh, afterglow of the Paige Van Zant effect, and had so they had these really high expectations for her the start of her UFC career. And we have seen, I mean, how special you have to be of an athlete to do what Paige Van Zant does and really win with little else but that athleticism. Because for Kern, it has it has not uh, carried her through. Um, <clears throat> and and that was really that like that was the main reason I picked Felice Herrig over her because. Like, well, Paige Van Zant can survive Felice Herrick's ground game. Can Kylan Curran, the lesser Paige Van Zant? I don't think so. And she didn't. So um, she's in here against someone who is kind of an all rounder like her, who has a pretty solid ground game, but also doesn't um, pursue it as maybe as much as she should. Who goes in there, Jamie Moyle, who goes in there and kind of tucks her chin and swings and isn't a great striker, but but is willing to stand in the pocket and trade. Curran will probably do her best to keep this fight at distance or when she does close the gap, put Moyle against the fence. And I do think Curran has been improving bit by bit. She just has not. This is a very tough division for a prospect to come up in in the UFC because It's shallow in that there are not many fighters, but it's very choppy in that most of those fighters are really good. So uh, it's just, it's tough to develop. You you get like one fight against a scrub and then you're in there against top 20 straw weights, which is the whole top 20 is pretty good. So um, in a Ryan Bader-esque way, it has shielded us from really seeing Curran's improvements. I think she comes in here, shows some pretty good distance management, um, shows some pretty good takedown defense. Probably takes a round to get going, but um, that doggedness, the willingness to throw volume, I think that's going to carry her in this fight. So I'm, I'm going with Curran by decision. <sighs> it's a this, tough one to call, man. It's this is tough, tough to know where either of these women are really at. Yeah, um, I definitely... Yeah, Curran, she is definitely one of those fighters that a lot of people got excited about where <laughs> I remember, I remember these conversations where I was like, she's not gonna win this fight. And you're like, no, she is, I swear. And which one was that? Uh probably the I don't I can't remember now. Actually, I think it was the Paige Van Zant fight, actually. That was the one where you were we were, we were talking about it 
against her against Paige Van Zant, and I was like, Paige Van Zant's way better at that game than Curran is. She's the same person, but better. <laughs> yeah. 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 It took that fight for me to start to come around to that realization. Like, you can't yeah. just, she's obviously athletic. She's got length. She's got a good build for this. Uh, and seems to have some good pop too when she actually gets down on a straight right. But you you need more than those innate talents. The tough just... thing in this fight for me is that both of these women can get completely bullied out of their game. Sure. Like uh, Emily Kagan, you took a round practically off. She Kylan did take Curran. a round. Yeah, a convincing yeah, took a round. round off just absolutely rushing her out of the gate yeah. and Curran looked shocked like she just had no I, no answer at all and i think in general that's going to be a problem for her going forward it's a problem that i don't even know that her camp can fix is that she's just a really slow starter it looks like you know, she has this, like, okay, I'm going to get out there. I'm going to feel the fight. I'm going to get into a rhythm. And her opponent says, like, fuck that. I'm just going to go out and beat your ass. Yeah. And um, she doesn't have enough of the fundamentals in place to keep that from being an ass kicking either. Mm-hmm. That's the problem. If it's not like, oh, I'm going to go out there and feel my way around and look, I can move out at range and I'm going to stay safe. And, you know, it's not Donald Cerrone where. <laughs> you can have some slow starts and Donald Cerrone still r- tends to ride a lot of them out without. Yeah. She, she seems a lot to me now that you say that kind of like an early career Rose Nama Yunus without the phenomenal grappling skills, which yeah. me, I don't know her, but it gives me the feeling that I would really like to see Kylan Curran under Trevor Whitman. Yeah. Cause he could get her those, those fundamentals and, and help kind of calm her down the way he has with Rose. And I do think that Moyle can bully her out of the gate. Can, yeah. And the the problem is that Moyle is not a big, powerful fighter either. She yeah. is small and she is scrappy, but she can get pushed around too yeah. pretty clearly. Um, and that makes this tough because you have two fighters that can be bullied who are going to face off against each other. And I think Moyle will probably have early success just because Curran starts so cold. I agree. Um, and the question is, I, I guess I'll pick Curran to turn it around afterward like she did with Kagan. But Moyle's going to have her opportunities. And Curran is not such a electric fighter at any point that turning it around might mean domination. Yeah. Yeah. So I'll take Curran, but it's it's a fight that, um, you know, I, it could get really ugly, honestly. Like, it could just become this sloppy cage-pushing festival of two it's, underwhelming <laughs> physical forces. It's, it's, it's one of those fights that I think of. Uh, am I, did I get suddenly louder? I can hear myself through your mic for some reason. Oh, no, you didn't, but... Um, it's one of those fights where I think it, one of the ones I'm not looking forward to necessarily because I know the action will be pretty good, but because it's like a necessary sorting fight for the bottom end of this division, it'll be, it'll give us some interesting insight into where one of these women, both of whom have potential that has not yet been realized where they really sit in the division. So, uh, on that note, yeah, the odds for that fight Kern is the under, underdog or the favorite rather minus 142 to minus 155 or 156 actually oh, 161 oh yeah somebody else actually said that we should actually a better way to go would be to pick a line and then talk about the movement of the lines which i kind of like that idea like how much they've moved since opening sure um well i can talk about the mean movement so That'll be that. That's my. That's what I'm gonna do. That's my new my new goal. Because I can do that. movement for all the lines. Yep. Okay. Cool. So, current has opened at minus one seventy. Is now at minus one fifty two as the favorite. So that odd has those odds have been closing. And uh, Moyle opened at plus one thirty and is down to plus one twenty seven. So those odds really have not moved at all since opening. As the underdog, um, I can see 
Yeah, I can see why the, the current odds would be getting shorter there, just because she's not a confident favorite yeah. in this yeah. fight at all. And I don't know that there's any bets I would place on this either. Straw weight's not a finisher's division largely, so betting on people to finish. Um, like this might be a fight to fight goes to de- eh, fight goes to decision is even minus one eighty five. Yeah, it's like that's not that's not close enough to make it worthwhile. And then under two and a half rounds is plus one sixty, which isn't really big enough to to bank on. Either of these women could very likely get a submission and win, but it's yeah. it's not it's, enough. <laughs> it's straw weight's not a finisher's division. It's just not. It's no, no. Um, and that brings us to. Dong Young Kim versus Brendan O'Reilly. Uh, I'm going to make this pretty short. I would be. Dong Young Kim has obvious problems. I would be surprised if Brendan O'Reilly has any of the tools to solve them. O'Reilly. <laughs> it's basically the perfect way to describe it. <laughs> yeah. O'Reilly is a brawler who does not have any of the physicality or durability necessary to brawl, and a grappler who does not have any of the athleticism or pure skill to be a confident grappler so all right now he's back at uh lightweight is it yeah um after a an unsuccessful well a one and one stint as a welterweight um in which he in which he beat somebody that much slower than him he he beat vic grujic in a competitive fight it was not a like a dominant win for him and then got yeah. absolutely ousted by Alan Joban, which is not surprising. It's uh, yeah. Back at lightweight, I think he's, he, because he's not a great athlete, he, he basically lacks all the things that you need to be a brawler. He doesn't really have huge power. He's not immensely durable. Um, and he doesn't have great stamina. And that's more of a problem at lightweight because he fights at such a high clip and brawls so often that it's a big weight cut for him. And he struggled with that in his UFC debut, and I expect him to struggle with it again. And, and while Kim has uh, been finished twice now in the third round in the UFC, he's also put on some really impressive performances going into the third round. And um, I don't know that, o- that O'Reilly can survive the kind of onslaughts that, uh, that Kim put on Marco Polo Reyes, for example. Yeah, Kim's, not, Kim's problems are that he's not powerful, and that he has no defense. He's skilled. He's offensively skilled. Yeah. And he throws good combinations. And he's got, you know, he's not a bad offensive wrestler or offensive grappler. But he has no defense anywhere. And so when he's in long fights with other good skilled athletes, especially ones who have power, a power edge over him, he's the guy who's going to get knocked out. Yeah, I mean, can he can O'Reilly stall Kim on the ground if he gets him down? Totally, I, I think he can for a round because I don't Kim's ground game. Especially yeah, but Brendan O'Reilly's board. ground game is right, but Kim's back game off his back is too passive. That's the reason I see it, where he'll kind of hang out there. But yeah. can O'Reilly do that for three rounds without getting clipped on the way in and getting hurt by a guy who I think definitely has enough power to yeah. to hurt his opponents and is pretty accurate when he throws? No, I don't think so. No. So, uh, yeah, I got to um, go with Kim. Let's see. Dong Young Kim is the favorite. Uh, he, let's see. Line moving from minus 110 to minus 124. O'Reilly, the underdog. Line moving from minus 130 to plus 101. And frankly, at uh, you can get Kim as low as minus 118 in this fight. I think that's worth a bet. Like, I yeah. I know I know Kim's got problems, but I would be legitimately surprised if Brendan O'Reilly won this fight. Under two and a half rounds is plus one hundred, which isn't terrible. Kim inside yeah. distance is plus one ninety, and I think there's a yeah. good chance that if he wins, he finishes O'Reilly. Yeah, but he should just be able to outpoint him too. Like either way, probably. It's one way or another. There's a bet in there for Kim. Because at this close odds, O'Reilly has not shown nearly enough. If you think, to, if you think for certain he won't finish O'Reilly, which there's no reason to think that certainly, plus no. 261 on Kim by decision. But <laughs> I, I think it's too chancy to go for. No, yeah. All right. That brings us to Rob Font, Matt Schnell. This, Love this fight. Yeah, this is going to be an interesting one. 
Talk up, talk about it. The my go. Yep. Um, I think very good things about Rob Font. I've probably made that clear on this show and others. I uh, made the foolish decision of picking him over John Lineker, oh but God. I do think that in that fight, he showed he's the kind of guy who could beat John Lineker. He had distance management. He moved and pot shotted really well. He caught Lineker quite a bit on the way in. He just couldn't keep his resolve. Up. It was the same game that Dodson played just yeah. much more passively. Right. It was, it was the same game Dodson played without like the, the chutzpah. It basically looked yeah. like a guy who didn't yet have enough experience to fight that smart fight against Lineker because yeah. Lineker didn't care if he got hit and Rob did. And that was the real difference. Um, and he expected Lineker to care about getting caught in the way in, and he didn't. And when he realized he didn't, he kind of broke yeah. and, and went very passive. He did survive John Lineker, which is good. He kept trying for the duration of the fight. So there's, there's a lot of good things to say about Rob Font. And he's, he's got great killer instinct and really good timing, both with his strikes and his takedown entries. He moves well. He just needs time to develop to really become the best fighter he can be. And I think he'll probably be able to do it against Matt Schnell, who is a solid fighter um, in basically every aspect, tends to come out and look like a striker in most of his fights, throwing combinations, throwing kicks, trying to get inside with his hands, but does most of his most impressive work off of his back, where he has a crazy aggressive submission game. Um, it, it's Most guys, I say, you know, if you're going to play guard, you have to be really aggressive, uh, Schnell plays guard so aggressively that he doesn't really stay in guard for long. He attacks a submission and often ends up on top or locked in or uses it to sweep and forces the other guy to escape. So it'll be really interesting to see these guys tangle on the ground. But I think most of the fight will be dictated by Font's ability to keep Schnell from getting into that range and, and really being picky about when he does choose to take Schnell down, if he does at all. So I think Font, with a long-distance striking game, is going to take a decision. Yeah, it's, it's interesting because Schnell has, like, he's obviously put a ton of work carefully over time to get better and better as a striker. And, like, that is where a lot of his effort is. You watch his old fights, and he would throw, and he, you know, it was these super clunky arms up, like, ugly hooks with his head on line. And then you watch his most recent pre-tough fights, and his head's moving, he's throwing in combination, he's, you know, he's getting in and out quickly, his footwork is improved. He's obviously putting a lot of work into that. It's just a question of how much work does he need to put into it to win fights that way. This is his his John Lineker fight, right? Rob yeah. Font is his John Lineker. Is he ready for this test yet? He may have the style to do it someday, but is he ready for it yet? Yeah, and Rob, the big the the big advantage he has over Rob Font here is that Font tends to be very low output, T tends to be very cautious about how he where he picks his shots. Now, to Rob Font's advantage, he has a lot of power, so he has he, he can afford to be cautious because he can he he's got had the ability in a lot of fights to hurt people even with pretty unassuming punches. He's got that thing where he's got like the, the super long arms and the super big hands, where there's just a lot of natural power on the end of him. And I think that that's going to serve him well against Schnell here because Schnell, for all of his improvements, still tends to come in on straight lines yeah. and tends to have uh, picked up the idea that uh, creativity is a replacement for fundamentals. Yeah, classic like, prospect trap. Yeah, like he, you know, he'll throw a bunch of, he'll, he'll lead with uppercuts, he'll jump in with hooks, he'll throw kicks without setting them up. And it's just like the, the technique is good. He's, he's sharpened up his technique on how to throw all these strikes a lot. But there's just no, like, fundamental structure of, like, okay, and I'm going to work behind a jab, and I'm going to cut angles, and I'm going to be careful about how I enter. And so he runs in and gets clipped in the pocket. Um, he's developed a pretty good dirty boxing game, a good inside game. But it'll be interesting to see if, again, somebody like Font, who's a pretty big bantamweight, if Schnell as a natural flyweight is just undersized there. 
to be competitive. So I'm I got to pick Font against Schnell coming up a division, but I do like Font, I, I do like Schnell's aggress- aggression and mm-hmm. his ability to be a much more dynamic and dangerous grappler than Font is, who tends to play much more of a let me get a takedown and land some decent ground and pound and spend a lot of time working for position game when he gets to his grappling. So I think there's a big opportunity for Schnell to score an upset, but mm-hmm. I'm going to pick Font to be the more the more patient and better uh, positioned range striker and basically keep Schnell from being able to get a lot of his grappling game going. Sure. Schnell is coming in as the underdog. Let's see, line has moved, opened at plus 160 and gone up to plus 205. So that line is getting longer. And Font opened at minus 210 and is at minus 254. So those lines have moved away from each other. In fact, it looks like they moved away pretty quickly and have stabilized since then. And I'm fine with that. Do you think anyone watching this show will be interested to see this? Schnell versus Font. No, oh, oh you got to talk. A kitten. Do you think anyone will be interested in seeing this kitten that's messing with yeah. my headphones? That, anyone that's curious one. why my headphone cord is dancing around crazily, it's because there's a, a beast attacking it. All right. That's <clears> lovely. <throat> that brings us now, distraction hey, to the side. <laughs> we have to hear your dog's ears flapping every episode. We can see my kitten, goddammit. Yeah, well, the dog, you can see the dog's not going to be doing much ear flapping at the moment. She's... <laughs> <laughs> just totally passed out over there. <laughs> as passed out as she gets. But, uh, all right, that brings us to a featherweight bout, Gray Maynard, Ryan Hall. Um, I would, Ryan Hall has a very good chance of winning this, and I would be very surprised if Ryan Hall won this. Um, he is a crazy dynamic grappler and scrambler with a deep technical game that is, you know, it's creative in ways that fighters tend not to be coached to deal with. But fuck if the one part of Gray Maynard's game that has not really changed much or gone away is his wrestling and grappling. I guess the biggest question would be against Alexander Yakovlev who was able to actually out-wrestle Maynard. Um, I forgot about that, but that's also at lightweight where Yakovlev was kind of huge. And I just, Ryan Hall, like the rest of his game is so underdeveloped. Yakovlev is a way better wrestler than Ryan Hall. Like that's, yeah, Yakovlev, he's got really good timing on his shots. He gets most of his opponents down. I think he got Kamaru Usman down at one point. So yeah, it, Yakovla, but Hall, like, he's got that Ben Askren craziness to him. Yeah, he's got some funk. Where there's the kind of funk that fighters just, or like Tony Ferguson, where, like, fighters just can't really prepare for that. They don't ever see it. Nobody does it. And so they're not ready for it. I still don't like enough of what I see out of Ryan Hall to pick him because of that. Like, I just, I don't trust the rest of his game. And I don't trust his, yeah, that's it, basically. I think Artem Lobov, I mean, it took, you know, Artem Lobov was able to survive on the ground and reverse positions and get up and, you know, and and has much worse takedown defense than Gray Maynard. And I think Gray Maynard is going to be able to turn enough of those takedowns away to stay, be stable enough on top often enough that um, Hall's game is just going to get shut down a bit. So, Yeah, I agree. I mean, the, the Gray Maynard fight with um, Fernando Bruno, basically Bruno wasn't a good enough striker to out-brawl Maynard. And he wasn't a good enough wrestler or grappler to beat him on the ground. And so if you're not going to bring that serious kind of striking threat to the table, then 
you need to be able to dominate Graham Maynard on the ground, and that is a tall order. All the guys we've seen making Graham Maynard look bad are guys who outstrike him. And the problem is not even that he's not a good striker. He's been a pretty respectable striker for a long time. It's just that his chin is going. Um, and some of his speed is going away. He's looking more like an old version of Gray Maynard, and, and that just it happens. But if you can't do that, and Ryan Hall can't, unless he has made some serious improvements at SBG since he went there, but then Ryan Hall has a very small window of opportunity, I think, to win this fight. Gray Maynard's never been submitted as a professional. Um, he has very rarely been taken down or put in a position on the ground that he did not decide. I think the only guy who's really done it was Frankie Edgar. And then Nate Diaz submitted him on the Ultimate Fighter. But Nate Diaz's submission record has proven that his game is a little more well-suited to MMA than maybe someone like Ryan Halls, who has not been in there just owning quality opposition with his submission skills. He completely dominated Artem Lobov in terms of position with his weird takedowns and everything, but he couldn't submit Artem Lobov. And if you can't submit Artem Lobov, you're probably not going to submit Gray Maynard. So... I think Gray Maynard, by either a decision or even by a late TKO, if he feels really confident on the feet and starts throwing hands at Ryan Hall, I don't see Hall having the ability to really back him off. Yeah, and, and we've talked about this before, but how many f- fighters outside of Conor McGregor have we seen get really like way better at SBG? Yeah. I mean, Artem Lobov looked really good in his last fight. But, but it was, that, <laughs> Naruto Ishihara has major problems. Like, we talked about this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> going in that like yeah. Ishihara was going to lose a fight really soon and the confident like part of the issue is that he's always been more confident than his opposition yeah and suddenly he's fighting Artem Labov who being confident and being like a brawler is is Artem Labov's go-to game yeah in Ireland no less where they love him so yeah. So I think, you know, there, there's – Artem Lobov looked great, but there's also something to be said for how bad Teruto Ishihara looked yeah. and got exposed in that fight. And you should really be able to – if you're, if you're going to dominate Artem Lobov on the ground, you should be able to submit him. <laughs> like, yeah. He's not been great against that kind of attack in the past, and Ryan Hall didn't really come close to finishing him at all. Yeah. That brings uh, – let's see, the odds on that fight uh, – Where is that? These things are all mixed up here. Yeah, they're all Ray out of Maynard order. is a mild, this is basically dead even. Gray Maynard is a mild favorite. Opening at minus 110, going to minus 113, uh, as low as minus 105. Hall opening at minus 130 and going to minus 110. So people have closed that line on Hall a bit but honestly Maynard at dead even odds I mean I think Maynard's worth a bet yeah Hall has proven so little in his MMA career to date other than that he can beat Artem Lobov I love Ryan Hall man I have some of his DVDs he, he's a pretty great guy but yeah I just and if he submits Gray Maynard, like that should be a huge achievement. People that, should that'll be an establishing fight where it's like, all right, we we have to take Ryan Hall really seriously. But I need to yep. see that fight before I can. Yeah. So at dead even odds, I think there's a bet to be made there. Not a you know, I wouldn't necessarily pick Gray Maynard to finish, but he might. I mean, Hall striking has not looked good, so his durability is probably Hall's durability is going to be challenged here. Let's see, Maynard inside the distance is plus 255. So, if he gets hauled down, like, Maynard's got some great ground and pound. Or even just on the feet. I remember I mean, yeah. he was he was tagging yeah. Ross Pearson when they fought not that long ago. He's, he's not... Hall, well, Hall, and Hall has no tools to hurt. We've seen no tools out of Hall to hurt Gray Maynard standing. Right, that's what I'm saying. Like, you have a guy who can kind of beat up... Um, TJ Grant for a bit before yeah. getting knocked out. You have a guy who can beat up Ross Pearson a little bit and have a really close round with him, whose only fallback is really that his chin isn't there. Then Ryan Hall's not the right guy to take advantage of that opening. Yeah. That brings us to the main card now, all still on FS1. 
flyweight bout, Brandon Moreno, Ryan Ben Ryan Benoit. I always want to say Benoit, but he's from Texas, so it's Benoit. <laughs> and uh, I believe is this you? I think this is you. Yes, sounds about right. Yeah. Um, oh, Ryan Benoit has not blown me away at any point in the UFC. Even I mean, I, I was impressed, of course, with his resilience his never say die attitude in the fight with Sergio Pettis uh-huh. um, he's obviously got some power in his hands but against people who can bring a really well-rounded threat he tends to look pretty unimpressive he uh he doesn't have great takedown defense he's pretty bad off of his back um and even as a striker he's a little too willing to his game is kind of just get into the pocket and start throwing combinations without a ton of defense, without a ton of setup, without a ton of distance management to, to, to really understand how that game would, how to optimize that approach. And I have a hard time seeing him overcoming the well-roundedness of Brandon Moreno. Now, of course, it's going to be hard to evaluate, evaluate Moreno going forward because he was a big underdog to um, Louis Smolka and got a surprising win. That obviously puts him above Smolka in the rankings, but I don't think it's safe yet to look at Brandon Moreno and say, this guy's going to chew up other fighters in the top five. He still has some holes in his game. He's still wide open, pretty sloppy with his striking. Um, sometimes a little too willing to grapple. You know, had he lost to Smolka, we would have been saying that about that fight too. He was too willing to tangle on the ground with the more experienced grappler. But those things aren't really going to be a problem against Benoit. Moreno is very tough. I don't think Benoit's going to be able to knock him out with one shot. Um, Moreno throws more volume. He attacks the body more and he presses his grappling advantage whenever and wherever he can, uh, even when he doesn't necessarily have an advantage in the grappling. So I think Moreno is going to get a submission at some point. I picked him by a second round submission. Yeah, it's a, uh, it's an interesting one. I, I'm glad they made this fight. I suggested it in my fights to make the after Brandon Moreno won his debut, because I think it's exactly the kind of next step test that he needs instead of going one up from Luis Smolka, fighting a very different kind of fighter showing Mm -hmm. that like you can actually compete at this level consistently. Not that you got one big upset win. Um, And I'm interested because Moreno, yeah, he's super aggressive attacks in very straight lines uh not powerful but will you know will push a grappling game to whatever conclusion it reaches yeah and it will throw in volume whether he's getting tagged or whatever's going on i do not so what i'm interested in is is he actually a good enough wrestler to take Ryan Benoit down? Because Ryan Benoit's takedown defense is not good, but is Brandon Moreno the kind of takedown artist that even, you know, even Ben Wen or Sergio Pettis or Josh Sampo are? And I'm not sure about that. Um, you know, Louis Smolka was kind of willing to pull guard on Mer- Smolka was kind of willing to pull guard on Moreno and take the fight he there was, very he was willingly. Way too confident and aggressive on the ground. Yep. Uh, Benoit won't do that. He's going to try and, you know, he's probably going to try and sprawl out. So this is going to be like Moreno actually has to show that he can hit actual, you know, hit the takedown. Right. Benoit's not going to just give it to him, even if he's, like I say, even if his takedown defense is only single level, even if it's just a sprawl. His game still is still built him. around not being taken down. Exactly. Yeah. Um. So, yeah. And beyond that, if Moreno is wait, waiting straight lined into the pocket on Benoit, his chin's going to get tested. Sure. He's going to get tested hard. Uh I'm going to take Moreno, too. I, I think that his game is well-rounded and aggressive, and he will pursue enough of a grappling game, and Benoit does have enough problems staying up. And Moreno's durable enough that he can survive and he can make it happen. He can be scrappy. He can force scrambles where Benoit will struggle. And 
But it, it's a great test. It's a great next fight for him. Because Benoit does have legit top-level athleticism. Yeah. And is an incredibly powerful puncher. But Benoit is a fighter who, like, you look at something like the Pettis fight and you say, this guy has a ton of potential. I can't wait to see him develop. The problem is just that he's a guy who will always have potential because yeah. he's been in the same place with his entire game for quite a while now. Yeah. He's, that Jinjara Mai Tai camp, it's like the same place, you know, uh, I think Rickles moves around a lot more, but it's the same place that got Rickles, like his basic striking start, I think, is, yeah. has been like a striking coach for David Rickles. And like, you look, once you realize that, and then you look at Ryan Benoit's game, it's like, okay, I, I see a lot more of this like power brawler fundamental ideology. Ben- Benoit is the Sam Cecilia to David Rickles, Michael Chiesa, <laughs> both yeah. coming from a camp where they teach a lot of striking, but it's not necessarily that great. <laughs> yeah. So odds on this fight, Moreno is the favorite. Minus, uh, he's let's see, opening at minus one seventy five, closing at minus one twenty nine. Benoit, the underdog, opening at plus one thirty five and closing at plus one oh five, or not closing, but. Currently at plus 105. I, I like the way the lines have moved for bets. I, I like Moreno as a slight favorite. Yeah, because he will walk straight in on Benoit. And his takedown game, his wrestling game, is a lot more based on how bad... Like it, It's the kind of thing that he was fighting some competition that could not wrestle at all. A lot of the guys he's faced are very... Oh, you grabbed one of my legs. Well, I'll pull guard and practice and work on my guard grappling game. Sure, flyweight shit. You know? Yeah, <laughs> regional well, flyweight and, shit and regional Mexico flyweight shit. Sure, yeah. And it's just, you know, it, it's not a game built on high level op- opposition, and it's not a game built necessarily on the level of athlete that a lot of flyweights are. Brando so, does have a good camp, though, right? What is the team that he fights at? Prime of? Gym. Yeah, which, and they've got quite a few solid fighters. They've got quite a few solid fighters, and but it's a different meta. It's a slightly different meta game than a lot of the rest of the MMA world is playing. So it, it's not necessarily, you know, it's one of those things where it's in, it'll be interesting to see how well that that camp and its fighters do as they continue to try to push people to an elite level. Like yeah, as they have more fighters in the UFC, how they adapt to the, like the typical Western, the American style of fighting. Yeah, and, the meta game needed to beat those guys. And an elite, an an elite level athlete like Ryan Benoit is a great test for that. You know, it's not the most yeah. complete game in the world, but it's actually like okay, here's yeah. a great athlete who's five. I'm, I'm grateful they gave Moreno this fight because what I said before, him being Smolka. They totally could have thrown him in there with like Horiguchi or someone like that and just gotten it dusted. It's really good. They they gave him a step back, one that will be a meaningful test against. Basically, just let him run the gamut of easy versions of all the kinds of opponents he's going to face, and that'll give us a good idea of how far he can really go. Yep. That brings us to a woman's band weight bout. Sarah McMahon, Alexis Davis. Um, I have to to pick McMahon here because Ooh. I know how she's fought recently. I have no clue what Alexis Davis is going to look like coming out of uh, having a child and being Did very... she have a child? What? Did she have yeah. a child and another? Yeah. yeah, she was out... Uh, t- took time off for to have a baby. That's Wasn't why we aware have- of why, why, why the layoff. Congratulations, Alexis. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that said, Alexis Davis beats a lot of fighters like Sarah McMahon. Frankly, she's the better women's bantamweight overall, right? Yeah, she she well she has the you know Alexis Davis. Her striking is like one of she is a Jake Shields. She's Jake Shields of totally. women's bantamweight. I think I made that exact comparison in my shirt dog preview. Where you you, you watch her strike, you're like, okay, this is totally ineffective and arm punchy and just wading in. And then she goes out and she beats Jessica. I and does it just because she's willing to just walk, walk forward and throw hands 
and get in there and scrap with people. And a lot of a lot of fighters aren't ready for that. You know, a lot of fighters aren't used to that. Especially fighters like I or like McMahon who want to be able to scare people off, who want to be able to create respect from their from their opponent and space. Somebody who's just like fuck it, I'll I'm just coming in regardless. You better be ready. It throws a lot of fighters off. And Alexis Davis has been able to lean on that a lot. Um. But I really like what I saw out of Sarah McMahon in her fight with Jessica I. McMahon hasn't made the huge jumps that people were expecting when she came in. Maybe the only person who liked anything about that fight. <laughs> I mean, I didn't like what like I you know what, what Jessica I was doing, but I honestly thought that that's the best Sarah McMahon has ever looked in her career. It was a smart fight. Um, she's punching with. You know, her her boxing has never taken the leap that people thought it would. She looks great in single techniques or dirty boxing inside. She actually, ha- you know, can tor- torque her hips. She t- gets digs into shots. But the moment she starts get throwing combinations, she off-balances herself. She overreaches. She still has technical holes. But, um, you know, I think she started to add actual ground and pound to her game. That's the biggest thing I've seen out of Sarah McMahon. Mm -hmm. And then she's just, you know, she's one of the few fighters that Alexis, because she's the level of athlete she is, Alexis Davis can't just wade in and hunt for a body lock takedown and then work a grappling game. Or, you know, maybe she can work a guard game. Maybe she can submit uh, Sarah McMahon off her back. But Sarah McMahon's top game has rarely been like a major hole for her. It's usually just been too control based more than it's been like, Oh, here's this major flaw where Sarah McMahon can just get submitted because she wants to stall out on the ground. To be honest, Lauren Murphy beat her off of her back. She should have gotten the win in that fight. Yeah, but she didn't beat her because she submitted her. She beat her because she was more active and Sarah McMahon was a blanket. Misha Tate, Lauren yeah. Murphy, some good grapplers have failed to submit McMahon. Yeah. Even Ronda Rousey couldn't submit her. <laughs> yeah. So well, she didn't really try. <laughs> no, she didn't really need to. So I I just think that um McMahon is going you know, that uh, the game may have eventually finally passed uh Alexis Davis by a bit. And the time off is going maybe especially hurting that. That being the underwhelming athlete who can just go in there and make stuff happen, uh, fighters have had to, the bantamweight division has had to evolve too much because of the rush of athletic, highly competitive women at the top of the division. Fighters like Shevchenko, fighters like Holm, fighters like Rousey, who have made these runs through people, are making other bantamweights be like, okay, I actually have to evolve my game more. And I, mm-hmm. I don't know that I don't know that Davis can just step right back in with who she was before, and I don't trust her to have changed. So I'm picking McMahon here. I don't trust her to have changed either. I also, I maybe I wasn't as impressed with McMahon's performance over I as you were. I certainly thought it was a smart fight. Um, Jessica I certainly looked bad uh, in that matchup, but um, also I, I'm, this will be the ding, 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 500th Ryan Bader comparison of the year so far. Sarah McMahon kind of reminds me of Ryan Bader in the worst ways. Like um, maybe she, she gets those early career losses where she, she's just smashed by the elites of the division. They're really dramatic. So they give you this kind of false impression of how bad she is. Um, but then she comes back and she wins a bunch of fights unimpressively. I could see that happening where it's like, she still looks like she's hittable. She doesn't look confident. She knows what her weaknesses are, but she is smarting, uh, smartly fighting around them. And maybe that's what Sarah McMahon will do here. I am going to pick Alexis Davis until I see Sarah McMahon do that because I think Alexis Davis is the better round winner. Um, I think even if she gets taken down, she may be active enough off of her back um, to threaten McMahon and, and give a good impression. Maybe even if she went around, at least to scare McMahon off of taking her down again. And um, 
stuff on the feet with volume. She she's totally the Jake Shields of women's bantamweight, uh, but she, she throws a lot. And Jake Shields yeah. has outstruck people. Oh yeah, and you're fighting someone who's not a good striker and who isn't really confident. Uh, then you can win rounds like that just by throwing like dozens of jabs and leg kicks. Jake and Shields has Tyron Woodley's number, man. That's right. That is what Alexis Davis can do. Um, and I, I think he's the more proven fighter to me. So I totally see your case for Sarah McMahon winning this fight. Um, stylistically, I think it might be there. I don't have confidence in her as a fighter yet to I just like what I thought of the eye fight, especially in her ground and pound. Like seeing her actually getting on top of people and throwing <laughs> yeah. strikes. Yeah. And not getting outworked, uh, you know, on the ground. Like that to me is a confidence booster for picking her here. But but Jessica Eye on her back is a far cry from Alexis Davis on her back. It's, it's true, a- but Jessica Eye is also like also a better athlete than Alexis Davis. So, yeah. you know, th- there may be more chance that Sarah McMahon can just be more physically imposing over yeah. Davis. So to me, there for the time being, there is too much chance that I fight. I was just more of a head case than McMahon, <laughs> and yeah. I don't think Alexis Davis is a head case. No, all. Alexis so, Davis is definitely not a head case at all. So if that was the reason that McMahon did get to, to look in some way impressive, then I don't think the same kind of thing will work here. Yeah. It's it's a it's, it's a weird fight. The layoff too has me it, weird. Is it is it not just a microcosm of women's bantamweight? It's just like the, these are like our top ten women's bantamweight fighters, yep. and they're just totally weird and uninspiring. It's it's what a division, eh? What I a mean, division. it's the reason that real you know women with deep technical skill bases in other sports and who are great athletes can come and run through the division and yeah. set a standard. Yeah. You know? why Valentina Shevchenko is one of two title contenders with like three UFC fights and a two and one record. Yep. Just because she has a fighting background. <laughs> yep. Uh, the odds, let's see. Uh, Davis opened it pl- is the underdog opening at plus 140 uh, to plus 153. McMahon is the favorite opening at minus 180 to minus 182. I would probably be willing to put a small underdog bet on Alexis Davis there. Sam McMahon is nowhere near consistent enough against high-level competition to see her as a any kind of strong favorite. Yeah, I agree. That brings us to a light heavyweight bout, Ion Kudalaba versus Jared Cannonier. Um, I'm also going to make this pretty, pretty quick, pretty easy. I think that Kudalaba... I have more faith in Kudalaba's boxing to win this than Cannoneer's. Uh, Cannoneer looks like a great athlete with real power, but he is coming from kind of like, he's basically learning MMA as he goes, it seems. And Kudalaba has this funky limited game, but Cannoneer's not going to challenge any of the holes in it. And Kudalaba seems like a strong, durable, powerful athlete who has yeah. shown in his two fights so far that you actually do have to be significantly better than him to beat him. Yeah. I, I, dur- durability, I think, is the watchword for Kudalaba going forward. Durability and aggression. Um, yeah. He ate some serious, serious shots in his last fight from, um, who's the Millennium guy? Oh, uh, Jonathan Wilson. Jonathan Wilson. He he ate some of the hardest, cleanest straight left hands I've ever seen not knock somebody out. Um, and with no issue whatsoever. Didn't get hurt, didn't stagger, didn't slow down, just kept throwing volume. Obviously, at some point, that's going to run out. Uh, and I would like to see him develop to the point where he's not relying on his chin so much. He's super uh, fucking young, though. He's 22, right? Yeah, he's... Yeah. Yeah, he I looks like he's 35 and has fought in several wars, but <laughs> he's only 22. He has that Enrique Barzola thing going on. Uh, Cannoneer probably does have the power, likely has the power to be that guy who who makes that I, my chin is indestructible approach fail for the first time. Coming down from heavyweight where he never had a problem knocking out gigantic heavyweights, 
I expect him to have a lot of pop at light heavyweight. He's fast. He covers distance well when he throws, but it's still a very limited game. The things that Jared Cannonier does well, I mean, it's a pretty short list. And if he can't knock Kudalaba out with these lunging long range strikes and he can't keep Kudalaba off of him, then how is he going to win a decision? And I just don't see it happening. Like, I, I think there's a pretty significant chance that Cannonier lands a huge shot that seals around or ends the fight. But even sealing around, if he can't do it twice, it's kind of a style matchup he's destined to lose. So I've got yeah. Kudalaba yeah. by decision. It should also be noted that uh, he, he hasn't had, you know, he has had some good knockouts, but he also did totally fail to knock out Tony Lopez, taking us going to a split decision in 2014. Hey man, Tony, Tony Lopez is, is, well, is he now super easy to knock out? Uh, I don't know that he's, no, he's never, he's not yeah. super easy to knock out. It's Tony Lopez. I mean, he, a lot of his he, fights been, are him not getting yeah. knocked down and then winning. I mean, what that was also it's, the story of his fight with um Corey, who's the Jackson Wink guy who is like a horrible sex offender. <laughs> oh, Cody East. Cody East. That was a story yeah. of his fight with Cody East who mauled him kind of for a round and then completely gassed. It's true. Tony Lopez has in fact only been knocked out twice in his uh very extensive 60- career. Fight yeah. career as a 43 year old. P- pretty impressive but, as a light heavyweight. Yeah, it, it, it is to show that. Or heavyweight, rather. Yeah, the Cannoneer um, knockout, even against somebody who's sloppy and out of shape and way over the hill, he has a lot of trouble winning. Right, yeah. So. He needs to hurt you badly several yeah. times to win the decision. Yeah, and he fights in these really short bursts, basically. Yeah. Like he's he, out, way outside, trying to initiate as little offense as possible, and then jumping in for like three punches, and then getting way back outside. Yeah, and it's like once every thirty seconds. I just don't think that's enough to beat Kudalaba. Another one of many people on this card with a lot of potential that has yet to be realized. And that brings us to uh, let's see, are the odds on that fight? Kudalaba is. Uh, favored, opening at minus 190, moving to minus 222. Cannoneer, the underdog, opening at plus 150, moving up to plus 180. I really don't know that those odds should be getting way wider. Um, you have two knockout strikers who are going to get a boxing match, basically. Not, you know, Kudalab is probably more likely to shoot for a takedown than Cannoneer, but neither guy is especially likely to take this fight down. Yeah, and uh, it's very unlikely that it goes the distance. And at that point, it should. It, it's not. You know, I think Kudalaba should win, but fight goes to fight goes to decision is at plus two twenty. So wow. that you know that tells you exactly what you need to know. Cannoneer inside the distance plus two fifty. Kudalaba inside the distance minus one forty. So maybe it's a small bet on Cannoneer inside the distance if you really want to make it maybe. underdog. But yeah, I, I would be kind of surprised if Kudalaba just knocked Cannoneer out easily, though. You know? Yeah. I don't think he's a huge single shot puncher in the way that Cannoneer is. A lot no. of his finishes are kind of swarming people on the ground. Yep. Uh, that brings us to a welterweight bout Jake Ellenberger versus Jorge Masvidal. And uh, is this you? I, I have no yeah. idea. <laughs> I have literally no idea. I, yeah, this is you. Okay. Um, interesting fight. Jake Ellenberger was almost back in a fight with Matt Brown. Uh, I don't think we'll ever see Ellenberger entirely back. I think at this point, he's a little too shopworn to really recapture that uh, prime prime ability and 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 all of the problems that already existed in him as prime Jake Ellenberger are, I think only more pronounced now, you know, getting older is not going to make you a better three round fighter if you can't knock the opponent out. And that's always been a problem for Ellenberger. Um, and, and, and the worrying thing is he beating Matt Brown, huge upset, very impressive, fought a very 
intelligent fight to do it. You know, started fast, kicked the body, basically all the things you want to do against Matt Brown. But the flinching and the worrisome facial expressions of Jake Ellenberger, they were still there. Uh, En route to that win, he had not yet recaptured the confidence that was once such an important ally for him, even with Rafael Cordero back in his corner. And I think his last fight was with Cordero as well, and he didn't win that one. So even back at his old camp where he was at his most successful, he still kind of looks like a deteriorated version of his former self. And could he hurt Jorge Masvidal early? Absolutely. Masvidal's kind of got a thing where he gets hurt, hit early in fights. And getting hit by Jake Ellenberger is very different to getting hit by, like, Rustam Khabilov. Certainly different to getting hit by Michael Chiesa. I think Ellenberger may be the most powerful puncher ever at welterweight. He has huge power in his hands. Um, and it's really just the fact that he's not the most uh, creative and skillful striker that that explains why he doesn't have more knockout wins. Um, but he hurts people pretty much every time he gets a win and often when he loses. So that could happen. But Masvidal also totally has the kind of game that Rory McDonald used to stymie Ellenberger. And if Ellenberger is a slightly worse or even a slightly rejuvenated version of that guy, he's going to have trouble getting past Masvidal's jab and kicks. Um, And I think he may even, if it does cause him to tire out, he may even get out-wrestled by Jorge Masvidal in the later portions of this fight. So um, it's a risky one. Ellenberger is slightly back, and that makes him a scary matchup for any welterweight. It's kind of like... Like, you can't go in confidently against Nate Marquardt anymore. <laughs> you saw him fade. You knew he was done. But you've seen him get a few too many surprise knockouts to ever now take a fight with him and be like, yeah, I got this, no problem. But still, Masvidal has the stylistic edge and is the fresher fighter. Despite being a little older than Ellenberger, I think he is still – he's got more life in him yet. His performances lately have not been unimpressive. They've been just typical Masvidal fights. So Masvidal by – well, let's see. What did I say in my preview? Because I can't recall if I picked a finish here. I think, hold on, finding it. I picked Masvidal by decision. So ah. I picked him not to finish Ellenberger. Yeah, I might actually pick him to finish Ellenberger. Frankly, not unreasonable. I, I hate to say this because it was a really awesome fight, an awesome upset, really cool. Ellenberger did not look good against Matt Brown. It seems like he has solved the problem. Like, the co- the problems of confidence with him have been solved not by regaining confidence, but by fi- figuring out that he has to start fast and has to really fly out of the gate and be put it on somebody early. And he can, you know he can't charged out. He clubbed Matt Brown with a huge right hand and dropped him immediately, but was unable to land the kind of meaningful ground and pound to follow it up. And then Matt Brown just kind of beat him up for a couple minutes. Yeah. Like a minute and a half. Matt Brown was beating him up. Yeah. And Ellenberger had no answers at all. He looked, he started, he was looking gassed. He looked, his mouth was open. He was flinching. He looked, he looked like the Ellenberger we had seen for the past few years. He went, he had two moments of old Ellenberger sandwiching like a minute and a half of, Latter day, Ellen. Yeah, I, I, I was saying while you were gone that I don't think it's that so much, you know, he hasn't regained his confidence, but he's found out that in order, because he doesn't have that confidence, he needs to start quicker. Yeah. Basically, he needs to fly out of the gate. He can't yeah. go in and measure and try and be patient and figure things out. So that, you know, that'll help him with Masvidal because Masvidal does start slow, yep. but Masvidal doesn't tend to get finished early. Like, He's durable as shit. You you know you don't. Has he? Has Masvidal ever actually lost a fight in round one? Uh, to Paul Rodriguez in two thousand five. That is the only time Masvidal has actually lost a fight in in round one. Mostly, you have to outwork him to really beat yeah. him. And and I think the last time he was the last and only time he was knocked out was in two thousand eight. Yeah, against yeah. Rodrigo Dom. 
Yeah. He, which is just well, one of those weird fluky things. Yeah. And so you've got somebody that's going to ride it out, going to be tough as shit, and somebody who may start fast and may put him on a, put it on Masvidal early, but is seems like he's going to fade almost immediately. And so I got to pick Masvidal here. If Ellenberger fights slow and careful, I absolutely pick him to lose. If he starts fast and violent, I pick him to fade and lose. Like, <laughs> I, yeah, he, like you say, he's shown he can be dangerous enough that you can't just be like, he's absolutely going to lose. There's no way he'll win. But uh, Masvidal is just, you know, Mas- Masvidal is not ta- Tamden McCrory. This is not one of those things where I, we were talking about that. I'm like, this is totally the worst possible matchup for Tamden McCrory, but I'm picking him because Nate Marquardt is fresh or is old rather. Yeah. This is not that. No. Masvidal still going, still going strong. Yeah. He looks exactly the same as always. Uh, odds on this fight. Mm, Let's see. Masvidal opened at minus 270 and has moved to minus 258. So very slight movement down. He actually jumped way up to like minus 180 and then has slowly dropped back down to minus 258. Um, And Ellenberger opened at plus 190 and has moved out to plus 209 and without quite the same jump. But a uh, slight one. I I think Masvidal, I think that's actually about right. You know, out in the minus 250 area or so, that's sure, fair. Yeah. And I don't know that I would necessarily pick any kind of upset or any, any odds, frankly, on this. Ellenberger is not durable, but Masvidal is not a great finisher at all. Yeah. When, when he gets an opponent that is can't engage with him and is obviously hurt, he just tends to take his foot off the gas and ride out the easy win. So no real prop bet to be made there. I don't think so. Lines look good pretty much yeah. everywhere. And then they look, they look brings, reasonable. I mean, pretty much everywhere. Not good for yeah. us. No. And that brings us to the co-main event: Joseph Benavidez versus Henry Cejudo. This is a damned, damned interesting fight. Yeah. And a really hard one to call. Henry Cejudo's game is, I don't want to say it's like meat and potatoes, but he's crafted, like, you know, you expect, like, oh, this super amazing Olympian wrestler. You know, you, you expect kind of this, and maybe it is a little bit Daniel Cormier, but you expect more of this sort of, like, Cormier or Ben Askren or – you know, John Jones-esque game where they're, like, developing this really funky – or Yoel Romero, where they're de- developing this funky athletic style that's just going to be, like, you know, all this outlandish stuff and blitzing and something, like, you've never seen. And you're just like, oh, my God, can you believe if we got more incredible athletes like this? So who does just, like, okay, I'm going to learn some kickboxing fundamentals. I'm going to work on a I great think- game. Actually, Daniel Cormier is a pretty good comparison. <laughs> yeah, it's just kind of like I'm 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 good athlete, a great wrestler, and I'm going to learn a really straightforward way of fighting. I think Daniel Cormier, he, he's Daniel Cormier's wrestling is flashier. Yeah, which than Cejudo's, which is why I still think of him as a little like out there. Like I think of that Dan Henderson fight where he's just like yeah. chasing him down and carrying him around like a little. I think- Cejudo's probably could be as flashy because those things also weren't what Dan uh, Cormier was known for as a wrestler. Yeah. Like, he wasn't the high crotch lift foot sweep guy as a wrestler. He was like a defender back taker, you know. Yeah. But but uh, he's such a phenomenal wrestler compared to his competition that he can afford to go out there and do crazy shit. Cejudo probably could. Yeah. Uh, but doesn't. Not but yet. Yeah, not yet. And so it's interesting because you have this very, like, learn the basics, learn how to use all the basics style. And then on the other hand, you have Benavidez, who has never really been a learn the basics, use all the basics guy. Team he Alpha Male a- is very much like, on our feet, let's learn some crazy shit. And 
mostly just big winging strikes. They got they they got the fundamentals for Ludwig very briefly and was suddenly like he is back with Ludwig now. He's he at elevation now. now. That's right. That's true. I forgot he's a splitter. People people Judean front. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's the people's front of Judea. I think uh, I think he's actually fairly full time at elevation now with yeah. Dillashaw and Ludwig. That's true. So and we, they, they, he did look a little different in the Mikovsky fight. He looked a little cleaner, a little more technical. And, and he, he looked busier, which is the yeah. big thing. Yeah. And that's going to be... Go on, go on, sorry. That's going to be interesting here because Cejudo, I, part of his, like, you know, this very meat and potatoes approach is that I don't... It's not really made to deal with people who are busy because he has to... He's trying to learn all these basics. He's trying to, like, he wants to be the busy, aggressive pressing fighter with this very offensive linear game and it's good like you know it's a good stable strong style to win fights but we've seen against uh you know demetrius johnson and not just demetrius johnson but Jose formiga and chico camus as well guys who are confident in their ability to stand with him who are confident that they can pressure him back have success because he has to wade in, and he doesn't always throw the kind of volume or the kind of uh, complicated combinations that his opponents will. He's not going to be as complex as they are. He's not going to be as diverse or as unpredictable. But goddamn if he won't throw two times as many one-two leg kick combinations as them. (laughs) Exactly. And so... This is going to be a weird fight with Benavidez because Benavidez, he can also, like, you know, he can be taken down. He can be, but he can't be controlled. Like, you can get Benavidez on his back. You can hit him. You can pressure him, but it's very hard to control him, and it's hard to outwork him over a long stretch. Yeah. Like he, he's, only- he's been controlled for short times by only two men I can think of, and that's Demetrius Johnson and Ian McCall. Um, and Dominic Cruz. Dominic Cruz. But basically, you got to be a damn good top control player to keep Benavides static on his back. Yeah, and Henry Cejudo's top game is, fun- is frankly not fundamentally who he is. Like, he's working, you know, his wrestling, he's got great takedowns, but he's yet to find to really finely integrate uh, ground and pound into his top game. It's there. He's working on it, but flyweight, like he's not just this massive dominating control player. He's much more of a, like, I'm going to put a lot of volume on you and I'm going to use my takedowns to change it up to make you think about it. And then I'll let you back up and put a lot more volume on you. And I don't know. I, I think that he's still a step behind somebody like Benavidez, especially working at team, El- or at, working at elevation, working under Ludwig. There's enough pressure in Benavidez's game. There's enough scrambling, and there's enough athleticism and power that he can press the same kind of openings that Formiga was able to do so to do, but with more success, with more power behind it, with more competitive athleticism. So, I'm picking Benavidez here. But Cejudo has grown and developed consistently. Yeah. And I actually expect that losing to Demetrius Johnson, especially the way he did, is going to be really good for him. It's going to be a slap in the face to just work that much harder and be like, you know, you didn't, you didn't think that Demetrius Johnson could compete with you in the clinch. And he owned your ass there. Yeah. And so, you're going to turn around. Came in- you came in with this sort of unearned idea that you were just better than everybody <laughs> in the division yeah. and were very convincingly told that, no, you, in fact, are not. And so I think that that's going to light a fire under Cejudo. I think that that's going to drive him. I think that's going to motivate him much more than success will or would have. Sure, yeah. I think so, you, you may be right, and I hope you are. Yeah. Um, I think... If Cejudo wins this fight, it has to be with his wrestling. This yeah. cannot be one of the many fights you've seen from him where he goes in there and kind of works out his striking, kind of overwhelms the person with volume. Benavidez is the better volume puncher, um, the harder hitter, 
obviously a more experienced guy, probably the better defender, especially with Ludwig in his corner. And so you can't go out there and have a kickboxing match at Benavides. He has too many tools. He's too creative, and he hits too hard. It's just not a good idea. Benavides can be taken down. That I know. You know, we, his takedown defense is good, but it's not uh, sterling. It's not in, impenetrable. And what it takes is good timing as Benavides is coming forward because his weird idiosyncratic style that you were talking about at the beginning of, of your analysis, Zane, uh, one, one part of it that makes it so weird is that even under Ludwig, he's pretty much all power punches. Yeah. Like everything Benavides does is at least 80% power. Um, and even when he's doing throwaway punches, he's putting his body into everything. And because he commits his weight to those shots that way, he can be taken down. And we saw that against Tim Elliott. Of course, we saw it against Demetrius Johnson. We even saw it a couple times against Makovsky, who was too predictable with his takedowns. But when he struck with Benavidez for a little bit, when he got him thinking striking, then he got him down really impressively. Yep. So Cejudo needs to do that. And I think... He probably can win some points in the clinch with Benavidez, which is not really Benavidez's strong suit. He's not a great clinch striker. He kind of leaves himself open to being hit and, um, you know, just kind of goes into wrestling mode there. So if Cejudo can, can basically get over on Benavidez with wrestling when he's thinking about striking and then get over on him with short strikes when he's thinking about wrestling in the clinch, he has a chance. But it's really hard to pick against Benavidez with all the experience, the volume he throws, the consistency with which he fights. Joseph Benavidez has only ever lost to Demetrius Johnson and Dominic Cruz. Every single other fighter he's fought, and he's been fighting top fighters for almost all of his career, uh, his 10-year career, he has beaten those guys, and usually pretty impressively. So I'm going to pick Joe Benavidez as well. I would really like to see Cejudo come out and show some changes, show that he took the right things away from that Johnson fight. And I really hope it wasn't a huge mistake to make this fight as his next one following that the first loss of his MMA career because what a crushing loss it was. And if he suffers another one, it could really throw his whole development off the rails. But Yeah, uh, it, 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 I, it, it, I would have wanted to see him climb back up to the top after that loss. I could have than- given him like Makovsky or someone, you know, someone yeah. – Who's who's still stiff test and won't let you walk all over him, but is is less proven than Benavidez. Yeah, John Moraga, Zach Makovsky, go Somebody. up <laughs> back through, you know, not just like Joseph Benavidez or Kyoji Horiguchi and just like figure you know, figure out if you're absolutely elite right now or get off, you know. Yeah. So it'll be interesting. Um the the other small thought in my mind is that you know, we were starting to get to a point where we were kind of thinking after, you know, shortly after that Demetrius Johnson fight, that Benavidez might be kind of stepping back a little. Yeah, uh, and I think I think Ludwig will help stave that off yeah. with the smarter approach, but I think he definitely is slowing down a bit. Um, yeah. So that could be something that plays a factor here if, you know, Cejudo is making big strides. Cejudo is still very young in his career. It does not have any of the wear and tear that uh, Benavidez does. And he may very well have taken the right lessons away from that Demetrius Johnson fight because one of his best moments of success, one of his only moments of success, was taking Demetrius Johnson down with yep. ease. So if he comes into this and he's like, you know what? I'm a, I'm a fucking gold medal wrestler. I can go in there. I've won the Pan Ams and the Olympics. I can out-wrestle these people. Then he may have a shot at victory here. Yeah, I would love to see him win because I do. I do think he will have taken the right lessons away. I just don't know if this is going to be too much too soon, right? Right afterward. Right. And 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 not to say I would like to see either of these guys lose because I no. like both these guys. Yeah. Uh let's see. Cejudo is the underdog for this fight, opening at plus one eighty, going uh, moving down to plus one sixty three, and. Joseph Benavidez, the favorite, opening at minus 260, moving to minus 196. Uh, I'm glad the lines have closed a bit. I think that, you know, both guys are top five in their division. It's an elite fight between two elite fighters. It's a great fight between two elite fighters. They both are active, 
busy fighters that do not like to give up rounds. But Benavidez definitely makes sense to me as the favorite. Yeah. And it's floating still around minus 200. I don't know that there's much to bet on there. I certainly wouldn't bet on either guy necessarily getting a finish or anything like that. It's flyweight. Yeah. It, none of the lines look tempting to me. Yeah. So that brings us to our final fight of the night. Tim Elliott versus Demetrius Johnson. And I believe this is you, yeah. I am excited for this fight. I think it'll be fun. I think Tim Elliott is basically an exciting matchup for anyone in the division because he's got such a weird style. And I would almost call it unique, except that it looks a lot like what Dominic Cruz does. You really, really get the impression that Tim Elliott admires Dominic Cruz's game and wanted to emulate him. And I said that um, before we started, I said that basically if Tim Boach has redneck judo, then Tim Elliott has redneck Dominic Cruz style, whatever you would call it. He does a lot of like specific Cruzian moves in his striking. And the, the real difference... Moonshine Dominic Cruz. Moonshine Cruz, yeah. I think, I think the it's important to, to recognize those differences and how they may help him because Cruz is the last guy to beat Demetrius Johnson. Um, so having that strong offensive wrestling, having the weird footwork and the, the, the weird timing, um, that can help. And I think there's another thing in Elliott's corner that helps him out is that he is kind of a pressure fighter. He likes to swarm people and keep them in a striking distance all the time where they really kind of react rather than thinking clearly. And um, that could be interesting too because Demetrius Johnson is, I think, proving more and more that he's really – when he's most comfortable, he's pressuring the other guy. We've seen that a lot from him in, in basically his whole championship run. Once he gets someone's figured out, he starts coming after them. And that process has begun earlier and earlier as he, he comes into his fights with more and more much deserved confidence. So, you know, Elliot, just sec, sorry, don't want to get too sidetracked here, but are there any champions that aren't pressure fighters right now? Cruz. Cruz, yeah, but yeah, there are, yeah. There, are, there are a few. There are some who have elected to pressure, like Cormier. You might call a pressure fighter, but really, I don't think it's his best attribute. Yeah, um, but it, it's kind of the Vogue style in MMA right now. It does seem to be. Maybe it's Conor McGregor's name. I, I think it's also just like when you get to that level in your game, even if you're a counter fighter, you. Uh, you eventually find that you're better off dictating the pace and the yeah. area where the fight takes place. Yeah, I mean, because it means pressure means a guaranteed capturing of the initiative. You get the yeah. other guy reacting to you, which frees you up to think and plan. Yeah, Tyron Woodley is like the most non pressuring champ, and it'll be interesting to see how long he is champ with that style. Right, yeah, yeah. Um, anyway, so. So I think that that is an interesting thing here, an interesting wrinkle that Tim Elliott can do a lot of the weird stuff that Cruz did that was effective against Demetrius Johnson, albeit like three and a half years ago. And he can pressure him, which may throw DJ off a bit because he likes to be the one coming forward. The difficulty is in the differences between Elliott and Cruz. And I think they are really meaningful differences. Elliott does not have Cruz's defense. Um, he doesn't have these weird, awkward sidesteps and pivots, the slips and rolls that Cruz is so comfortable using. Uh, he's not quite as ready with his reactive takedowns, which are like head movement with offense built in. Um, he just kind of ducks a lot when he's in the pocket. He, he lowers his eyes. He ducks his head. And if you hit the top of his head, that's great. It doesn't really affect him. But if you're smart with how you throw your strikes and you throw a knee or you go for a takedown as he pops back up, or there's any number of things you can do to a guy once he has decided to take his eyes off of you and ruin his own posture. Um, there's a lot of openings there for different things you can do, whether it's clinching, taking him down, hitting him with a strike at the moment he ducks, a lot of stuff. Uh, or just moving when he's not looking at you, you know, and getting out of the way. There's a lot of openings there. And Elliot does that a lot. And that is more of an issue because of his pressuring style. Because unlike Cruz who's always in and out, side to side, never sticks around for much longer than it takes to throw maybe two punches. Elliot is always in the pocket. Um, he likes to be in that distance. And so as we've discussed with guys like Thomas Almeida, it places even greater emphasis on good defense because he is there to be hit or there to be taken down. 
Elliott does not have stellar striking defense. He does not have stellar takedown defense. And I'm not convinced that he has stellar stamina either. Um, I don't think that against somebody with Mighty Mouse's conditioning, he can go in there and press the action the way he has been for his last few fights and do it for more than two rounds without a serious degradation of his, of his, of his abilities. So, yeah, it's, I think Tim Elliott will get two really fun rounds of Demetrius Johnson. He may take Demetrius Johnson down with his awkward wrestling more than anybody else has. But I think once Demetrius Johnson figures him out, and it may not even take that long, he's going to make Tim Elliott look bad. It's also worth noting, too, that, you know, Demetrius Johnson, like, he has actually, he's fought Dominic Cruz, so he's seen this style before. Like, he's seen yeah. the way Tim Elliott he's moves. He's also way better than he was when he fought Cruz. I yeah. think that, that has been kind of a story that's been forgotten because DJ's been a dominant champion for so long now. We're like, oh, he's always been this good. He wasn't this good at the start of his championship reign. No. He has dramatically improved since that first fight with uh, Joe Benavides. You yeah, know what I mean, like Demetrius Johnson would wreck Ian McCall if they were to fight today. He yeah. did wreck Joe Benavides. Everybody he's rematched, he's destroyed them more emphatically than he did the first time. I think he would be really competitive with Cruz. He might win that fight. So, yeah, yeah it's 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 not. It, it would the be same openings thing. are not there anymore. Yeah, the big thing, like I, I, watching, you know, his fight with Pedro Nobre, even for Tim Elliott, like. Even after a round, like by the end of a round, his footwork went, you know, you stopped seeing a lot of the quick movements, a lot of the cruise kind of footwork that he showed in those flat, you know, early on in the fight and became much more of a flat footed striker who was darting in in bursts of offense and then stepping into the pocket and staying there. And so I'm not, you know, it, it could be one of those things that, like, he just, you know, he wants to do it and he can do it early in rounds, but as the fight goes on, it just kind of fades away into the background. And that makes it, I don't know, that that does not fill me with confidence against Demetrius Johnson. Um, you know, Elliot's not, he's still not any kind of knockout artist. He's picked up his boxing a lot. He used to have the pro the problem he had in the UFC other than facing good competition was that he tended to pressure and act like and be he tended to be busier than he was effective. He tended to pressure more than he threw and he tended to throw more than he turned into effective offense that landed and did anything to his opponent. He stepped that up, but he's still, you know, not become a, you know, some sort of amazing knockout threat or, you know, st striker who can win without a lot of control. And if he steps into the pocket a lot against Demetrius Johnson, I'm not sure that Johnson can't just wrap him up. You know, Johnson is obviously much smaller than Elliot inside. But Johnson is a very, very good clinch fighter. Like, nobody really gets the advantage of Johnson in the clinch. He, he has, I think, the best pure Muay Thai clinch skills in the UFC right now. I mean, the only guy who can compete with him for a really Muay Thai clinch game is maybe Matt Brown. Obviously, the rest of Johnson's game surrounding it is much better. And he's also yeah. much better at incorporating his wrestling skills and his boxing skills into his Muay Thai clinch. So he has all these beautiful setups with these little pulls, these quick turns, targeting with his knees and elbows, classic Muay Thai switch-up stuff, but then also the head position and the body punching and uh, short punching of like dirty boxing and wrestling. Yeah. So it, it is the most complete clinch game in MMA. And the thing is, is that that kind of clinch, it tends to negate a lot of size and strength advantage that other fighters will have over you. I, I think Demetrius Johnson is probably surprisingly strong when you fight him too. Oh yeah, he, I'm sure he is. He <laughs> has this like small man build, but if you look at him, it's sometimes it's really surprising when you look at him in his fight and you see him from behind, you're like, holy shit, he's kind of built like a, like an aircraft carrier. Like he's, 
he's really broad and solid in his torso. I think he, be, I get the feeling he's a lot stronger than he looks. Oh, I'm sure he's very strong. I mean, he's, it's the ideal MMA build, you know. It's the opposite of the uh, Alex Yakovlev build, which is like the worst build to have as a fighter, where you're <laughs> tall and thin and short-armed. Well, if you're if you're gonna be a tall guy, you want to be like the McGregor. You want to have really long arms, big ass hands. And you even McGregor is have... not very tall. He's not. I mean, no. he's tall for how thin yeah. he cut down. It's like but... long legs and arms more than it is like a, a huge height thing. But then Demetrius Johnson is what you want to be if you're a short fighter, which is really yeah. solidly built, fast enough to close the distance. Um, but still, I, I really think he is actually a pretty powerful flyweight, and I think he's probably getting stronger, which yeah. is. Probably the reason for uh, part of the reason for the finishes he's been getting lately. So yeah, Elliot. I mean, I like his. He's a much better fighter than he was when he got cut. Yeah, I'll say that first and, and foremost. He's always fun. I was really surprised watching tape on him again because my memory of him was a dude that everybody else was like, "Oh, I love Tim Elliott. Tim Elliott's going places, and I'd watch him fight." I'm like. He does so much that gets accomplishes so little. Why are you excited about this? He makes a mean face while doing Clay Guida moves. But. Yeah, exactly. Like it's just so busy with so little going on. But he's really stepped up uh, and actually started to put offense behind that. Yep. Um, but that just also, you know, that he it's it's such a huge leap to go from that to beating Demetrius yeah. Johnson. Yeah, and and I've said this about a lot of fights lately, but I think it's it's often a good way to determine who will win. Um, as far as the pressuring thing goes, it could be an interesting dynamic. But Demetrius Johnson is stronger reacting to pressure than Tim Elliott is doing the same. You know what I mean? Like Demetrius Johnson's stronger in Tim Elliott's area of strength than Tim Elliott is in his. Yeah. And usually, if you can overcome your weaknesses better than the other guy. That's a path to victory. So the odds on this, they're not unexpected. You know, Demetrius Johnson is, <laughs> they opened, he opened at minus 1,000. Looks like there was some sort of, there was a, maybe a potential mix up in the odds because there was some absurd spike that down to minus 106, which makes no sense. But Yeah, that's probably human error. Yeah. But they're de- now back to minus nine, and they're now at minus nine seventy. So they basically haven't moved for all intents and yeah. purposes. Um, Elliot opened at let's see, plus six hundred. He has drifted down into five fifty territory. He is now at plus six eighteen. So there's some movement on that line, but I had nothing I would really pay much attention to. I will say I think Tim Elliott has a better shot than that. Yeah, I mean, it, it's basically – it's a fight you wouldn't bet on the underdog unless the odds were absolutely ridiculous. It's one of those fights where once it gets past like the 300 mark on either side – it, the the fact that you shouldn't be betting on that underdog guy doesn't change from that yeah. point onward. Um, I, I I'm looking for Johnson inside the distance. You know I think, what? I would go. I would say under four and a half rounds minus one fifteen is a maybe worth yeah. a little bit. Yeah. The the tricky thing is that both of those lines are at like even odds minus yep. one ten or thereabouts on either side. But Johnson by a late finish seems to be a pretty reliable pick these days and Elliot does have a better chance than like say a Chris Carriasso but I don't think he really has a significantly better chance than a Cejudo or a Bagatinov you know he's kind of on those guys yeah he's on that level and so picking him to win is crazy it's much safer to say will the fight I think under four and a half rounds at minus 110 which is what I have is a pretty good bet yeah, that might be worth worth a look. All right. Well, on that note, any any last calls? <clears throat> no, I had. Um, let's see. That fight under four and a half rounds. Gray Maynard, I think, is totally worth just a straight bet over Ryan Hall as such a very slight favorite. Um, 
And then it was, let's see, I think Alexis Davis, a small underdog bet. I think Brandon Moreno is worth a bet over Ryan Benoit. I think it's a very winnable fight for him, and he's a very slight favorite there. And, yeah, it's actually a fairly bettable card looking at it. it it's not bad. I think maybe um, Mutapchich. I think Young and, Kim, Maestro, yeah. over Brendan O'Reilly. Yes. And that one, too, um, had some value in a TKO, I think. Let's see. Kim inside the distance is plus 190. Yeah. And I think that's not a bad bet. Or betting on to go under two and a half rounds to cover your butt a little more at plus 100. That's not terrible either. Yeah, fair enough. A couple opportunities on this card. All right. Well, on that note, we're going to wrap things up. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in. You can find me on Twitter at These Ain't Sam. You can find Connor on Twitter at Boxing Bush. That's B-U-S-C-H. You can find both of us over at BloodyElbow.com. Give this video a like. That's a thumbs up down there on YouTube. That helps us a ton. Subscribe to MMANation.com. That's D-O-T-C-O-M. That is our YouTube channel. That's where you'll find all the rest of our shows, interviews, analysis, all that stuff that we put out every week. We will I'll be right back with a Bellator vivisection, so you're free to stick around for that. And uh, then we will have uh, – I'll be doing vivisection – or a uh, sixth round after the show. And then we'll be right back getting ready for UFC fight night, Lewis versus Abdurakimov. Uh, or, or Abdul Rakimov in uh, Albany next week with what a great card that is! What what a great card that is! Can't you? Aren't you excited for that one? You know, I'm still more excited for it than I am uh, that Melbourne card. That Melbourne really? card with a serious low point. Like I'm much more interested in Randy Brown versus Brian Camozzi sure, than yeah. you know. Or Derek Lewis versus Shamil Abdurakhimov from Francis Ngannou versus Anthony Hamilton. Like, I want to see it, Ngannou and Lewis fight. You're more interested in Brian Camozzi than you are in seeing Chris Camozzi lose to Dan Kelly? Because that no, was... That was an ultimate highlight of that card. It was a good fight, too, actually. Yeah. But I'm interested in seeing, you know, Shane Burgos and Mark Diakiese. Like, there are some fighters on this Albany card sure. that I'm actually interested in. Yeah. Much more so than that... Melbourne card, which was just tough 24 finale deserves oh, watching. Yeah. It's a good card. It is. It is a, f- these, you know, these next couple cards, these are some fun fight night cards. They should deliver some fun action. I'm, I'm looking forward to them, even if they don't have much in the way of name fights on them. So thanks everyone for tuning in. We'll see you next time.